Equity, especially the one that's mentioned, which I think has some real markets. Anyway, I'm going to kick things off. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We're going to begin the venture pitches momentarily. Could I ask Cheryl Winston Smith to join us in the <laughs> judging area? We've got plenty of seats. We're going to begin the venture pitches momentarily. Come fill in, don't be shy. Are all our entrepreneurs here? Yep, yep. You guys ready? Sierra? Yeah, where's Sierra? Sierra? Come on up. Test, test, yep. Just hang out for a second. I'm going to say hi to everybody. Just have a seat with the other, the other kids. There we go. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? Great. Welcome to Spring CEL Showcase. Um, this is so much more than just our venture pitches this evening, although I'm so excited for you to hear from our entrepreneurs. Um, as you saw for the last 30 minutes, a variety of our middle school and upper school CEL classes were showcasing their work. I was so impressed with some of the work that's happening in SketchUp, 3D printing, the robotic arena over there. Um, so thank you to the students that came out to show off their work. And also thank you to their instructors, um, including Vince Day, James Martin and Peter Randall, Judy Callis and Colleen Joy, uh, Daria Maidenbaum and Sarah Figueroa. Uh, I saw, it's such a pleasure working with all of you and it's the skills that our students, our students learn from the CEL curriculum that leads them to this stage. So it wouldn't be possible without you. So thank you, thank you so very much. Um, this is a really exciting night and I feel like I probably shouldn't even be up here. Uh, I've been out for about a month, raising my first kid, uh, Theodore. And while I was gone, Jessica Stokes, who's running around, um, was doing all the work. Um, so everything that happens on this stage tonight, as impressed as you will be by our entrepreneurs or by the students you see, it's all thanks to Jessica. So before we go any further, can we just have a round of applause for Jess and all of her work? Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, but for those of you that are new to Demo Day, here's how it works. We have um, six entrepreneurs that will be pitching their businesses this evening, some nonprofit, some for-profit. They'll each take about five to seven minutes to pitch, and then our judges will have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, at the end of Demo Day, um, we will talk about what resources they need to take their businesses further, whether that's funding, mentorship, guidance. The idea is that this is not the end of their journey when they take this stage. It's just the beginning. In fact, we have some entrepreneurs pitching tonight, uh, like Andrew, who have gone through this process many times. And the goal is to take things to market. But that's not the only goal, because this is a learning process. Students struggle and fail and have to make their way and overcome through adversity. Um, students learn brand new skills like web design and app design, coding, how to pitch, how to do various fashion projects, um, how to reach out to animal sanctuaries and ask them about uh, lion hunting. Um, so this program is about communication, it's about project management, and most importantly it's about pursuing your passions. And that's why I love working with these students every day. Um, the students you're going to hear from today are really representative of the traits of an entrepreneur. Um, Andrew Kramer and Emma Stern, two of the entrepreneurs, are examples of determination and experimentation, core to entrepreneurship. So these are two students who have been in either my office or Ms. Stokes' office. It feels like every day after school for this entire year. And they were just trying to figure out what's the idea, what's that great thing they want to pursue. And I think they've both really struck on um, some interesting ventures that have real market potential. Michael Berry, um, a new student in the incubator, is an example of how a passion can be focused uh, and honed to affect positive change in the world. When Michael first came into the incubator, he wanted to do something involving uh, the environment and basically saving animals. And as you'll hear tonight, 
that idea has really become laser focused and he's come up with something really unique that I'm excited uh, for him to share with you. Um, Austin Giedrich and Tyre uh, Lempener, did I pronounce that right? Sorry about that, man. Um, they're wonderful examples of how entrepreneurship happens all throughout our amazing school here, not just through this Venture Incubator program. Austin and Tyler have spent the entire year working with Vince Day as part of an upper school coding elective. Um, so while they didn't go through the formal Venture Incubator process, they've been building commercial applications for iOS devices. Um, and that's just one example of how the entrepreneurial mindset happens all throughout SCH every day, and it's why it's an amazing place to go to school, an amazing place to work. And then finally, we have Sierra, our only middle school student who will be taking the stage today. And she's an example of courage. It takes real guts to stand up on the stage in front of friends and family members and teachers and a panel of judges and present your idea and share your passion with the world. Um, so, Sierra, we're all so proud of you, and you're going to be great, and thank you so much for being part of this process. Uh, before we welcome Andrew to the stage, just a few more thank yous. Our judges, Leslie Newbold, Cheryl Winston-Smith, Nick Esposito, and for the very first time, a student judge, Vicki Cohen, eighth grade entrepreneur. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your guidance and support and advice. And then finally, our mentors. So. As you may know, every student in this program goes through it with a mentor, holding their hand, giving them real-world advice and guidance. So I want to thank Beth Ann Mandia, Morgan Berman, Bill Adair, uh, Drew Shantz, and Sandy Cohen for all of their hard work and guidance. Thank you, mentors. Thank you, judges. Okay, and first up to the stage is Andrew Kramer. Do we have an introduction, or are we just going to dive right into this one? Beth Ann, do you want to come up and introduce Andrew's venture? Fabulous. Thank you. Um, I'm Beth Ann Mandia, and uh, Andrew was my student uh, entrepreneur this semester. Um, I have a few things to say about Andrew. He's really bright, excited, and passionate about this project. And uh, what I found really special about him is that the the idea for his venture, this venture and other ventures that he's worked on come from his real experiences. And so he brings a passion to the table that, you know, is exciting because it's something that means something to him. So whether or not this venture works, which I hope it does, um, I think that Andrew's an idea guy. So there's going to be something that sticks and uh, he's going to be a success no matter what happens. I'm excited for you guys to hear about this venture. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Kramer, um, and I'm the founder of Campus Overnight. I'm also a junior in high school, which means I just began the exhausting college visiting process. And so far, I've visited tons of different schools, and I've realized one thing. Um, the, all the campus information tours and or the information sessions and campus tours are all too similar. I needed a unique experience. I really needed to see what it was truly like to be a student at each of these campuses. An overnight visit offers an unparalleled experience for a student to truly learn about a school's culture, student life, and campus environment like no other visiting option. College is a huge decision to make for a high school kid, and it's best to know everything you can about the school, which an overnight visit provides, unlike the normal information tour or the information session or campus tour. As aside from being an interesting and unique way to learn more about a school, overnight visits have proven to be extremely effective yet underutilized. A study done by Ruffalo Noel Levitz, the leader in college recruitment and strategizing, recently found that out of 61 different practices instituted by, nation, by colleges nationwide, overnight visits proved to be the second most effective. They also found that for four-year private or four-year public institutions, overnight visits for high school students were one of the five least used strategies, despite showing immense promise and uh, effectiveness. After speaking to many admissions representatives myself from a variety of different kinds of schools, I learned that admissions um, representatives have a really tough time setting up overnight visits simply because they are too difficult to facilitate and require a lot of manpower and labor to run smoothly and effectively. Campus Overnight is a unique white label web solution which will provide colleges with the opportunity to implement, organize, and facilitate overnight visits on a large scale for all prospective students. Campus Overnight will have a 
strong focus on the compatibility between the student host and the visitor in order to ensure for the most effective and successful visits. It will also allow colleges to expand any current overnight visiting options as well as implement and start new ones. I was able to mock up a prototype using a software called Just in Mind, um, and I'll walk you through that. So Campus Over is a white label web solution, uh, meaning I would customize it and design it for each institution inst interested in it. So this is what it would look like for the University of Pennsylvania. Um, there'd be three different portals, one for the student host, one for the visitor, and one for the college themselves, so they can oversee all connections in order to account for the safety of all the participants and make sure everything runs smoothly um, during the visit. So this is what it would look like when a student goes on to the Penn website um, and wants to get started with their overnight program. So as you can see, they'd press get started. Um, first, they would just answer a couple questions about themselves, such as their gender, uh, when they're available to do the visit, as well as uh, just a couple words about themselves. And this is all so the matching algorithm utilized in the software will be able to find compatible hosts that would best be able to um, suit their needs while visiting campus. So they, they'd also explain a little about what sort of some of their interests. So we can say uh, reading, art, and writing. Um, a couple of things they want to see while on campus, whether it's visit a class, um, go to a campus event that's happening at the same time, or even talk to a professor. Um, and then this is school-specific information, such as majors that they're interested in or, or what they're looking to study while they're at the school. So from there, the, the software would provide a list of compatible hosts where the, the student uh, visitor would actually get to select the host um, rather than the admissions team connecting the two, which really uh, provides a unique way for students to learn more about the school because it provides a host that they'd actually enjoy and like while visiting. Um, it also takes a lot of the pressure off of the admission staff to facilitate these connections. So let's say I decide to choose Olivia after reading her bio and um, looking at her majors. I would then be informed with a little bit of information about Olivia, a little bit of information about the event and um, her dorm room, what to bring, as well as uh, where the dorm will be, and uh, so ways to get in contact with the people. So the, the student um, portal as well as the undergraduate host portal would be fairly similar as they both involve the same kind of questions. But on the other side of things, this is what the admissions portal would look like so they can oversee all visits in order to ensure for the safety um, and make sure everything runs smoothly regarding the participants. So let's say these are all the visits that will be happening. Um, let's say I click on the visit between Caroline and Olivia. They'd be able to see uh, all participant information so they can check in the students, uh, make sure everything set up correctly as well as any visitor requests. So let's say Caroline wants to see a class or go to a campus event, they'd have direct access to Olivia's class schedule so they can best find a professor in a class that would be right for her, as well as any current events um, happening at Penn. So they'd be able to see that as well directly from the software. And then there's also a couple other features such as messages and questions that would be, they'd be able to answer directly from the platform as well as um, May be able to check to make sure all the liability forms and waivers have been signed and completed before the visit. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a white label web solution, meaning um, the colleges would purchase the platform for a specific price uh, for an annual subscription based on the size of the school. And from there, I would, org I would uh, design and customize the platform, particularly for the institutions, so they can rebrand it and market it as their own program. Um, after that, the colleges will be able to incorporate it into their visiting page, and from there, any prospective student will be able to be matched with a compatible overnight host via the matching algorithm. Currently, there are no other uh, companies or solutions trying to maximize and revolutionize overnight visits um, at colleges. However, there are still traditional admitted student overnight programs. However, like I mentioned earlier, these are only able um, to be offered to admitted students that are a small group of students because it's hard for colleges to offer them on a large scale because of the difficult resources and they don't have enough time um, to do so. And there's also a handful of schools offer college flying programs, um, generally only offered to students from underrepresented backgrounds. And like I said, there's only a select group of students that are able to do these and they require uh, an admissions process to even get into one. And Campus Sherpa is a website service uh, which offers individualized tours for students in 45-minute, uh, two-hour, or five-hour increments, although that's extremely expensive, ranging from 60 to $300 to shadow a student for a couple hours. Um, and they're also not associated with the university at all. Uh, my first year startup my first year startup costs are expected to be about $26,500, and this covers everything from developing a working beta version um, of the software 
to setting up a domain and server license as well as advertising, promotions, and legal fees. So my next step for this uh, process is to develop capital to start developing the, the product. And from there, I'll be able to start testing the product in order to find the most effective way um, to create this solution. Um, I'm going to continue to speak to admissions officers from very, uh, many different schools in order to continue to gauge the market and find interest in something like this. Um, and then from there, I'll be able to actually test the product with smaller schools. I've been able to talk to smaller local schools who have had interest in something like this so that they'd be able to offer the effective overnight program to all students who'd be interested. I've only been doing this for a short time, but after my research, I realized there's a huge gap in the market for something like this. And with your help, I think we could revolutionize the way students learn about and visit schools. Thank you. Andrew, fabulous job. Uh, do we have any questions from our judges? So um, what's in it for the host? I just had a question. Uh, you know, maybe there's gear or something at the school store. I don't know. Do they earn points or what? Yeah, that was my one question. Yeah, great job. Um, I have a couple of questions. One of them is, how does it fit in with the existing post-admittance programs that, that schools have? And um, I guess kind of related to that, what is the benefit to the school of bringing in a lot of people for overnights if they might not be, a, um, you know, if they're not gonna go get into the school? Now, uh, so like, like I said, a handful of schools have programs strictly for admitted students or even students who have already deposited uh, their money who are definitely going to the school, and they'll try to find a way to let them stay over with a host. Although even that, even the, let's say, 20 kids who are interested in doing that from the admitted class, it's still difficult to facilitate for the admissions host because it's all um, manpower and labor intensive. There's no technology out there that's doing it for them. Um, so it would be able to do that, but at the same time allow them to offer them, open up it. Uh, the program for all prospective students, which would help them increase their yield um, and even retention from uh, students who are ex accepted to students who actually decide to go, which is what all colleges are looking to do. Um, and they've proven to be effective in that matter as well. So it would help them with all aspects, whether it's including the, increasing their retention um, or just having more students apply to the school. And then that's um, my second question is how does the admissions office then measures success of this. You, know, mm -hmm. you have a way of building in performance indicators. But, you know, and for, for colleges, the way the model typically works is that you know, once they've gone through the whole sorting and matching process and decided on who they're going to admit, then it all comes down to yield. And mm -hmm. so you know, for them, I guess there's a benefit before students apply mm -hmm. um, in that they're maybe attracting more students to apply who might be a better fit. But then once they're in, it seems like that's where the real um, money sell is for the, for the admissions office because it's actually they've come down to who they think would be their ideal class and they'd like um, to get the yield as high as possible. So how do, do you have a way um, built into your beta version where they can track yeah, that? Yeah, track that. Yeah, so, so definitely, so I'm definitely going to try to track the retention. So for the next year when they decide to buy it again, because like I said, it's an annual subscription, um, which is also for a pretty small, small price, um, 
I'm definitely going to incorporate some kind of surveying option um, in order to track that so that way we can provide them with data and statistics the following year to show them how influential and how helpful the program has been to increase their yield and rate. Um, and it'll also be able to incorporate to, uh, other CRM solutions that they're currently using, which is customer relation management solutions, um, and it can, which provide data and feedback um, for everything that they're currently doing to attract uh, students to the school. So it would use um, different algorithms to, to provide that kind of feedback to show them why it's actually working and why they should continue um, updating their subscription. Great, thanks. Yep. So that, that was kind of mine. Um, <laughs> was just, uh, I guess to add, from like a student perspective, because mm -hmm. it's tough to keep the quality up if yeah. you were not in charge of that, right? So it's the school's in charge of that. Yeah. Um, so this sounds kind of like a, you know, like a dating app, Uber type possibility yeah. where, you know, the kid, you know, is a host and then you get to like, the per maybe they rate each other or, you know, mm -hmm. something like that so that they know, the school knows who you're really good Mm -hmm. um, host star, yeah, and exactly. they get to funnel it. Because I, I worked when I was in college in an admissions office, and it was a tough thing to do. I yeah. agree with your problem that you said is it's really tough to match good tour guides mm -hmm. with people that need to. Mm -hmm. um, so I, otherwise, like really good. I think we're allowed to talk about presentation too. Yeah. Um, the use of the multimedia. Um, what was it called, Justin? My Justin, mind? Mind, the prototyping software. Yeah, that was awesome. It was like you used it seamlessly. I didn't think you didn't stumble over it or anything like that, and it really helped me take it from the idea that you said into actually seeing that it would work. So, yeah, really cool. Awesome, thank you. I love the idea, but do you know if this would um, the tour take place before or after admission to the college? So the the idea is that um, you'd be able to do the overnight visit at any point in your college process. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, if you are an admitted student, um, the colleges would help implement this, whether they use this program just for their current admitted students program in order to make it more seamless and more effective. Um, but the whole idea is that any student in the, in the college process would be able to, to perform an overnight visit um, because colleges can't offer that now because of how, how difficult it is to organize and facilitate. Because I, I'm a junior now, and I, I'd love to stay overnight at school. It's, it's, I, from my research and from my own experience, it's one of the best ways to actually learn about a school. It's not as biased, it's more genuine, it can be individualized. Um, but most schools won't give juniors the opportunity, whether they're small schools or big schools, because they had to save that strictly for the admitted students that um, they want to attract even more. But this would allow them to do that for all students, no matter where they are in the college process. Um, and there's currently nothing doing that right now, so. Thank you. Yep. You ready? Come on up. Okay. Hi, I'm. I'm Sandy Cohen, and I worked with Sierra Hudson on her Canyon fashion. And Sierra briefly came to me in Close Closet um, with a very ambitious idea. It had three key components, which I think is unusual. Um, she had an upcycling. She had a, a, uh, a doing good for, for other kids, as well as the idea of making some money along the way. And like any entrepreneur, along the way, her ideas evolved and grew, and I look forward to hearing about what's going on with Canyon Fashion now. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name's Sierra, and I'm going to be telling you about my business, Canyon Fashion. Canyon Fashion. Hi, my name's Sierra, and I'm the founder of Canon Fashion. And what Canon Fashion is, is it's a upcycled clothing line for girls. And for every item sold, we donate 50% of our profits to organizations that give to children in need. So I love fashion and do-it-yourself projects. So I applied to the Venture Incubator with the idea of making clothing and giving some of my profits to children in need. I did some research and found that 13,000 Philadelphia children live in poverty. That means that kids in the same city are in, the, are in need of clothes that fit and are in good quality. I decided to start making some phone calls to local nonprofits that donate clothing to kids. I learned that they were always in need of many sizes and types of clothing. 
I decided to partner with Angels of God Clothing Closet in New Jersey. They were founded like, they are a small organization founded like someone like me. They accept clothing donations and give free shopping sprees to kids in need. They were so excited by my idea to donate to them. I then started to think about where I would get my clothes, then I would DIY. My mentor, Mrs. Cohen, and I met in the clothes closet every week. That's where we had the idea to upcycle and sell rejected donations. Rejected donations are anything that can't be sold because it's ripped, stained, or too worn out. I will upcycle these donations and create new clothing. Upcycling is the process of transforming unwanted products into new materials or products of better quality. Here's how my business works. First, I collect rejected donations, then I cut, dip dye, style, sell online to customers, and donate 50% profit to angels of God. My costs are low since the clothing is donated, and I volunteer my time to make the clothes. The dye kit for one shirt costs $4, but if I start to buy in larger quantities, I will be able to reduce these costs. I would like to show you my first design. This was a long sleeve white t-shirt from the clothes closet. I cut the sleeves, braided the back, and added dye. So. This shirt and my future designs will be available on purchase on my website. So here's my homepage. The first thing the customer sees is a mailing list sign up form. On my about page, customers can learn where my clothes come from and how they are helping kids in need. The products page will have pictures of my clothes that are available for sale. This is the last page, which is where you can donate clothes. Thank you to my mentors, especially Mrs. Cohen, for her time in clothing donations. I'm excited to make more DIY clothes so I can support children in need. donate clothing to you um, and do you have specific things that like mostly t-shirts or so, do you have anything specific? So if, they like si oh. so if they signed up for the donation form what they would do is they would fill out the form and then I would get their email address in my email okay. and then I would like contact them personally. Perfect. Okay good because I've got some things for you. Mm. <laughs> Uh, great job, and I think it's a really creative idea. I love, um, I really like the idea of upcycling. I don't know if mm -hmm. you coined that term, but I, th I think it's a really yeah. cool, cool way of describing it. Um, my question is a little bit related to, to the previous question in that how will you um, get people aware of what you're doing and how will you encourage people to um, donate clothing? Are you going um, to be... I haven't really figured that out quite yet. Uh, so one idea might be to tie into things such as um, the clothes closet or Green Street or um, you know, sort of existing consignment shops and maybe sort of be focusing on the, the nonprofit aspect of what you're doing, mm -hmm. see if they, they might be able to both give you um, a source of, of clothing and also kind of put some of their customers in touch with you. Just something to think about. Thank but great, you. Really great job. I think you did a great job as well. Um, I think what's really strong about your idea, besides you being passionate about it, is the idea of upcycling is like a really, trend, like you said, mm -hmm. trendy thing. You know, uh, this, you know, the current generation that's coming up is more socially um, interested when they're buying things, right? So mm -hmm. when they know that like they're going to come to you, they know that they're going to make a difference at the same time. So I think that's a really strong thing. And from a presenta presentation standpoint, it was really clean which is really good. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, students will try to, you know, 
crowd the slides and everything like yeah. that. And you were really nice and clean, and you were right and direct to the point. So I thought you did a good job with that. Okay. Thank you. Job. I love your slide deck, and I think your idea is very, very nice. Do you know if this would just be online, or would you have a storefront as well where people could donate and you could sell? Um, I haven't really figured that out quite yet because I'm not really that far into the business, but it might. And have you considered having something where people would bring their clothing in and remake it and ha um, pay you for it and then bring their own clothing back home? Yeah, I have thought about that before, but I, just, I didn't want to do that. All right, thank you. Okay, Mr. Day is going to introduce our next entrepreneurs. I'll put this up. So our, our next group of entrepreneurs, they didn't go through the uh, formal venture incubator process, but they've been with me for a couple of years of coding classes. Um, through those coding classes, they learned the core fundamentals, techniques, concepts associated with computer programming, um, where they... they built a set of predefined tasks or uh, predefined apps over the last couple years. But a few months ago, they had the opportunity to start to design and develop their own unique ideas. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Austin and Tyler. So my name's Tyler. And I'm Austin Gedrich. And as Mr. Day uh, said, we are students representing his um, coding portfolio class. And um, we've both taken um, this coding class for um, several years. And um, we've created a number of apps. And we're um, going to present two of them that we've been working on um, for the last few weeks. So in. Um Mr. Day's coding portfolio class, we've worked on, um, we started out working with uh, uh, a basic, basic pro, uh, coding program called uh, CodeHS. It's, it's an online website where you just learn the, learn the fundamentals of coding and learn the basic functions uh, of how to code on your own. Um, we also learned how to code with HTML and CSS, which is uh, designing websites online. Um, which is different from Code HS. Um, for the last year or so, we've been learning Swift um, in Xcode, which is um, the coding language which allows you to create um, iPhone applications. Um, and we've created um, several apps, such as Brick Breaker and Mad Libs. I've personally created like an Asteroids game. And um, those are just a few of the apps that we've created. So now I'm going to uh, talk, to you, talk to you guys about uh, the app that I've been working on the past couple weeks. Um, it's called MyFair. So um, I'm here today to share with you guys a revolutionary app idea um, that changes the way that, um, that, uh, the driver, that drivers can give friends uh, car rides that are affordable for the driver. Um, so what is MyFair? Oops. Uh, so what MyFair does is it takes the number of miles that the user will travel, it takes the user's vehicle's mileage per gallon, and the number of passengers that are in the user's vehicle, and it calculates the price of gas that each pa person, each passenger has to compensate the driver for. Um, so on the right is what uh, the, um, the screen looks like where you have to fill in all of the, uh, all of the um, mileage and uh, the price will display on the bottom there. Let's see. Um, so my target demographic is uh, college students and high school students. So the reason being um, college students, an example of them using this app would be uh, if they're coming home, if they're about to be on break and uh, they're coming home, uh, if they're driving to a, whatever city and they put up a poster on a bulletin board at their college saying, I'm going to this city. Um, if anybody is willing to split the, the price to go with me, they can, so call this number and we'll go. Um, so uh, using this app, they can uh, accurately cal calculate the price that um, the passenger needs to pay the uh, driver to compensate for the amount of gas that is used. So an example of a high school student using this is um, a high school student just gets their license and they may have a job or they may, may not. Uh, so 
If, if they do have a job, it might be low income, so it's hard to pay for their own gas. And if they do give people rides, then uh, their passenger can help them out with that, with an accurate um, price. So, so my goals for the future with this app, um, I would like to do more with the design. I've only been working on it for a couple weeks now. Uh, and I've, I would also like to make it more user friendly because uh, after all, it is mostly the driver that will be using this, so it needs to be safer for them to use. Um, I would like to add more features, I would uh, such as using an API to get um, the changing price of gas uh, instead of a constant, which I was using for this app, which is $2.64 uh, per gallon. And I would also like to use uh, add, a, add a GPS feature so the driver can use the app throughout the duration of their trip. I would also like to advertise the app uh, on school campuses and uh, <clears throat> online. So let's all, I will show you guys how simple it is to uh, work. So here it is. This is the starting screen. Um, click here, it says get compensated. Um, so all you have to do, put in miles per gallon, let's say 10 miles to the gallon, uh, two people in the car, and you have to look at your odometer. So let's say the car has uh, 100 miles on it, and then they ended up with 200 miles, so they were going 100 miles. I calculate price, price of trip. Each person must pay $13.20. And so at the bottom here, I put a little um, asterisk and I said the uh, price of one gallon of gas is a constant at $2.64. So that is my app. Um, okay, so the app that I will be presenting today is called InstaU, and what it is is the first anonymous picture sharing social media app for students. Oh, whoops. Um, so first I'm going to take you through the user experience after downloading my app. So the first thing that students will see is that they have to create a profile and to do so all they have to do is provide us with their email and their school name. Now this is important because users are able to remain anonymous and they're able to provide very little information about themselves but if they're to um, uh, post a picture that um, other people wouldn't want to see then we're able to flag it and we're also able to um, ban them from using our app. Then they press the sign up button and they're, they're joined now and that's all they have to do. And um, they're instantly given access to the school's feed. Um, so viewing the school's feed. By typing in the school's name, the user is immediately connected to all of their classmates and all the pictures that they've posted. And they're also able to post pictures so that all their classmates can see. Um, posts are added to the feed in real time, so as soon as a post is um, added, all the users will be able to see it. And the user can like or dislike a picture, and they're also able to scroll up, and they can either um, view or post a comment. Um, trending posts. Users can see the most liked pictures of the past 24 hours in this um, view. Um, to qualify for the top post section, each post must um, reach a minimum amount of likes, and additionally, they also have to have a high number of, or they have to have a high like percentage, which would um, be calculated by likes divided by dislikes. Um, these posts are view only, and the user isn't able to interact with them, which means they're not able to um, like it, and they're not able to uh, post any comments. Um, so the user is also able to post a picture. Um, users are given access to the camera or the photo library by pressing the InstaU icon on the navigation bar on the bottom of the screen. Um, the standard iPhone camera pops up as soon as uh, you choose, you uh, press the take a picture button and you also have the option to choose a picture from your photo library. Um, the user is then given the option to add a picture before they want to post it. Um, so I envision that um, InstaU ads will be just as important to businesses and small businesses as Facebook ads um, because we can reach a very specific demographic. Um, 
So businesses are offered two tier, um, tiers of ads. The first tier is that ads will be available to see by individual schools, which is really important because businesses are able to reach um, a demographic where they know the general age and the general location of the people that they're reaching. Or they're able to go for tier two ads, which are available to um, see in the top post category, which is also very important because they're able to reach a large amount of people. So a few of my inspirations are um, obviously some very, uh, very successful apps. Um, there's Instagram, Snapchat, and Yik Yak. Um, Instagram, obviously I've taken a lot of um, the feed section from Instagram and just a lot of the features. And then Snapchat, I've um, kind of tried to integrate some of the more technical aspects of in, in, uh, Snapchat into my project. And then uh, Yik Yak, I have, um, I really like the anonymous feature of Yik Yak, and I think that uh, that part makes my app very unique. Thank you. Nice job, both of you. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question for you. What is API, and how could an you API? connect that the gas prices to your app? Okay, uh, so an API is um, it's a piece of software that um, you have to put in your code. You get it from a website, and you often need a, a key for it. You need like a password for it. So there's a company that ma uh, that makes them, and uh, the API that I was looking at, um, you were able to retrieve retrieve the, um, the, the price of gas, because uh, gas changes, obviously, in price. So um, from that software that that company has, I can take that and put it in my code, and uh, through my code, it will keep on updating constantly, because it's run through that software, instead of staying at a, a constant number, which I use, I'm currently using. Yeah. Just, I was just going to, for Tyler, are you, um, how do you get people to use this instead of, say, Instagram or, or Yak Yak or, yip, yak, or Facebook, et cetera, Yak Yak? Um, you know, I guess people have limited attention, so how do you mm -hmm. kind of get this out there well, and get them using that? Yeah, well, um, like I said, um, my app is, is unique from the other apps. It's different from um, Instagram because it's anonymous. And yet, it's, it's different from Yik Yak because you're able to post pictures instead of just posting words. So I guess the idea is to um, draw as many people in. And once people see that they're friends and a lot of people that they know have joined the app, um, I would be able to draw the people's attention away from other apps and towards mine. Okay, sorry. So I, I tried to have questions for both of you, but I'll try to keep it quick. So, um, Tyler? Mm -hmm. Okay, so why is it, um, or at least some things to consider, why is it targeted just to students? And is it something that they're going to be doing in school? <laughs> because as, as like, cause you're making right. it seem like anonymous, and as a teacher, I'm thinking, ooh, I don't know if I want them being anonymously talking about things that are going on at school. Right. Is that something that's happening? Or like, why, why couldn't I, as a non-student, use it? Um, well, I mean, I just thought that the easiest way to um, connect everyone was through their school. Mm -hmm. Of course, we could, you could, um, I envision making groups that are outside of um, okay. school groups and or just someone's individual school and um, people in the future, people will hopefully be able to make their own groups and then just have people join that way. Okay. I have a question for Austin. Yes. Do you have any direct competitors for yours? So there are a couple uh, competitors, but none of them are geared towards um, the passenger compensating the driver for the amount of gas that's used. All right, thanks. Great question. Yep. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate it. As uh, Morgan Berman makes her way to the stage to introduce our next entrepreneur, I just have a quick story to tell. Tyler, you knew I was going to do this. Um, 
three years ago when we started this program, Tyler was one of our first entrepreneurs, and he had what I thought was a really amazing idea to connect um, students with physical disabilities with Little League teams, like kind of a buddy system. Um, but we made uh, the, um, I guess, questionable decision that year to have the entrepreneurs pitch in front of the entire upper school. And Tyler came to me one afternoon and said, Mr. Glassman, I'm not going to do it. Um, and I was, of course, disappointed because I loved his idea, but I knew in my heart that this kid had an entrepreneurial spark. So even though it's a smaller audience, I'm so proud that you got up here. And I think you took like an hour to prep this afternoon. You've grown so much, um, and I'm very proud of you, and I can't wait to see what you do next year when you go to college. So please have another round of applause for the time. All right, and now my good friend and accomplished entrepreneur and Springside alum, Morgan Berman. Thank you. So I had the pleasure of being the mentor for Michael this time, and Michael started off with very um, heartfelt and grand ambitions, and over the course of the last few weeks, we were able to bring it down to a very specific project that solves a very particular and important pain point um, that actually comes from his home country in South Africa. So we're going to learn a bit today about um, a very sad practice that's been going on and something that you can all do about it today. Michael? Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Berry. I am a 17-year-old 17, 17 SCH student. Um, the first 15 years of my life was spent in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, animals play an, in very, uh, an, a very important part in the South African culture. It is an icon to the country. Predators, especially the lion, played a big role in my life. It was an animal that gave me inspiration and drive from a young age. It went on, I went on numerous trips to see these creatures. In fact, this summer I'll be doing the exact same thing with a friend from my school and as well as with my family. This is me at age four. As you can see from my facial expression, I'm not very happy about catching this fish. From a young age, I have not been a huge fan of capturing animals. Um, on to a more serious note, according to the IUCN, lions are currently on the vulnerable list for extinction. Lions are in jeopardy of extinction by the year 2050. This is a scary fact for myself and many others around the world. Canned hunting is very quickly dropping the lion population. This, currently worry, this current situation worries me for the animals that mean so much to me as well as the rest of the world. This is one of South Africa's most beloved animals, if not the most beloved. Canned hunting is a process where lions are bred in canned hunting farms um, re uh, played with by younger, stu uh, younger students and kids in school, um, they get to pay for it, and as soon as it gets to a certain stage, they allow to be hunted. Um, so, a loss of the lion um, does not only affect the fact that we don't see these, we don't get to see these cute, um, majestic animals. However, the more important note is that a li an ex the extinction of a lion will affect the ecosystem dramatic drastically. Uh, as you can see here, this is a lion food web. The effect of the animal right at the top of getting um, e uh, extinct um, could affect the food web drastically in negative ways. We, went, we have let too many animals get too close to extinction, just like the polar bear, the panda, and the rhino. Over 200 farms with over 5,000 lions in captivity in one, state, one province in South Africa. They are treated terribly, totally malnourished, disease infested, they have cramped living styles, and they are totally not taken care of. There is a lack of funding and support going towards lion sanctuaries around South Africa. This is, caused by, this, is a, this, this is causing imbalance in the sanctuaries and canned hunting farms. I intend to even out the balance um, between the canned hunting farms and the sanctuaries. Canned hunting farms are very dangerous. They are, they are very violent to the people who are trying to stop them. And this is why I intend to help the lion sanctuaries um, grow the population of the lions. There are many Europeans and North Americans coming to South Africa to hunt the lions, and other animals for that matter. 
People like this in these pictures have no regrets about killing these tame beasts. Um, wealthy people are paying over $20,000 to do such an act. One main reason um, this still persists is there is a huge lack in awareness and government support. The government is totally oblivious to this, and they push it aside just like they do with anything else in the country. And this is why I believe that people like me can make a difference in South Africa, uh, make a substantial difference in South Africa because of, of being in the USA. Living in, the, living in South Africa for 15 years of my life and having absolutely no idea that this was going on shows that there's a huge lack in, of awareness. First, I am going to try and create uh, a viral challenge where you post a picture of your dog or your cat with a lion man on its head. This is similar to the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. You'll first have to buy a mane and all the proceeds will go towards lion sanctuaries. This will create more awareness as well uh, as, well as um, help in a number of ways. This is a mock-up post on Twitter. Um, it is very similar to the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge where you nominate um, people to do it after you've done it. So, as I said there, I will be nominating Ms. Stokes and Mr. Glassman, and once they buy the lion mane, um, they post a picture of it and they nominate someone else. Um, you'll also have to use the hashtag BeAware to create the awareness and to just let people know about it more. Um, if canned hunting farms fall apart and lion sanctuaries have enough support from, from organizations and nonprofits like I do, um, they'll be able to support um, thousands of lions released from these canned hunting farms. Um, they will not, they'll unfortunately not be set free due to the tameness that they had in the canned hunting farms. However, they will live a full, healthy, free roaming life. Canned hunting is a terrible industry. Animals are getting killed for a lot of money. We need to put a stop to this as soon as we can, was said by Gigi Glenetting. I've spoken to many activists, uh, many animal uh, rights activists over the time, and Gigi Glenetting stuck out the most to me. She is a lady who inspired me to do this all. Hearing her strong opinion on this industry really inspired me to act upon it. Animals have played a huge role in my life, and to be able to make a difference to this means the world to me. Let this cub and its father live. Reassure it that it won't be hunted, period. Um, this, actually hits home this actually hits home close for me, quite literally. I do not think the human race should allow any animals to become extinct. If we act now in the early stages of this process, we can seriously make a difference. Hashtag hear me roar. Thank you very much. I love the idea of doing your best to stop this hunting because that is a big problem. Who do you think would be the best people to reach out to get advice on this? Would you reach out to the animal rights activist community? So um, I have reached out to many animal rights activists um, as well as the World Wildlife Foundation. And I noticed a flaw in the World Wildlife Foundation when they're really concentrating on the animals that are in, their, um, critical, on the, in the critical list of extinction. So I, the people that I would go to for this are definitely animal rights activists in sanctuaries in South Africa because obviously talking to canned hunting farms would not work because they want it to happen. So talking to animal sanctuaries in South Africa and animal rights activists would be my go-to for advice. And, yeah. Um, I, thought it was, I thought you did a great job. I think lions, obviously, are an animal that people are going to connect to. You know? um, I think from a presentation standpoint, you told like a couple jokes in the beginning, and that was really good. Um, but since it's such a serious topic, you weren't goofy about it. So I think you really bridged the like, maturity you know, level that I think you really need to have. And I think that was really good because it was, it was funny and disarming, but at the same time, you had a good tone. And that was really good for me. Um, I just wanted to make sure, so what exactly would you be doing again? You're raising awareness, are we raising money? So, um, be like the thing that you do. So those are the two things that I would intend on doing. So raising awareness um, for this, um, for canned hunting. So trying to get people to not support it and people to actually know about it. As I said, I lived in South Africa for, for 15 years and I'd never heard of it. Um, so I noticed that there's a huge lack of awareness there. So a lack of awareness would really help this cause. Um, that's why I want to do the thing that's similar to the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Um, but then also, 
from the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, I'd like to um, get donations from that and from the people have an awareness of it, they'll be able to donate to me or um, other sanctuaries and things. That, that's an awesome thing. People would love that. Or like, um, like Snapchat, you get a lion thing for a day. You know, like a lion uh, that was a, for a day. That was an idea, yeah. I don't know if that's something that you could come out of that, but that would be really cool. It's a really cool idea. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it was a really powerful presentation, um, and I think you did a, a great job at it. I, in terms of understanding the magnitude of the problem, I think it would be helpful to have some numbers on you know what is the number of um, lions that are that that are killed this way every year. What is the percent of the population? Um, is it only limited to South Africa? My 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 prior guess is that no, it's probably broader than just South Africa. Um, and then I guess kind of thinking about it in terms, because it, it strikes me that the magnitude of the problem is actually quite important and quite large. Um, so it would be nice to, you know, I, I can see the value of raising awareness and trying to raise funding to give to um, sanctuaries, et cetera, but is there also a way that you might be able to tie it into existing groups, um, you know, through the UN or through um, global agencies where you could actually have an impact on a larger scale? Um, that's sort of more in, in keeping with the magnitude of what I'm guessing the problem might be. Sorry. Um, so I try to communicate with the World Wildlife Foundation, as I said, um, and they were not very um, knowledgeable about this. As I mean, they they obviously know it, it's existent, but um, when I had a, when I was communicating with them, they were sort of um, they sort of just speak about the animals that are more. Uh, more endangered in a way and that's why I'm thinking like why wait for the animal to get in, uh, into any critical um, extinction rate because um, at a certain stage it's really hard to uh, gain the population back so that's why I'm th uh, so it was like I felt there was a little bit of a gap in the World Wildlife Foundation where there wasn't enough awareness on this um, from their standpoint um, but then also I think helping other lion sanctuaries and getting other there's a there's a, a foundation called Blood Lion, and they are an, an, a big group that's supporting canned lion canned hunt canned lion hunting in specific. So there's another there are a couple foundations that are helping this. That's great, and I don't know if you can answer this, um, but do you have a sense if World Wildlife Fund might have reacted differently if you were not a you know did they know you were a student and do you think that was part of it or do you um, think it was just not on their radar screen? They did know I was a student. Um, I introduced myself as a student, so they didn't put down on me in a way. Because okay. sometimes, uh, and I have done this before, where they sort of, you speak to them, and I, I guess a lot of people talk to them about these things, um, and they sort of don't take everyone's input. Um, but I just, yeah, I introduced myself as a student. Maybe they didn't take it seriously. But I, I tried to get a lot of information out of them. It was like a 45-minute conversation. Yeah, but... They didn't really give me much feedback. Um, just quickly, I think you did a great job, and I think your idea is very clever, and I think it has a lot of like branding opportunity because the lion is so cute and everybody loves the, the mane, and you could do a lot with that, with the Snapchat and the, um, the ice bucket challenge type of thing. So I think that's really great, and I would agree that some numbers um, would actually help your, you a little bit, but, and charts and whatever. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit, but it was fantastic, so thank you. Thank you very much. Will you set up hers? She doesn't want mine. All right. This is the second time this year I've had the chance to introduce one of the first students that I met when I started this summer. I met Emma on the volleyball court, and I don't think I've ever seen her stop smiling since. Uh, she is constantly glowing. She has an amazing, infectious energy. She could probably sell you anything that she wanted to, even the paper clips in front of you. But what she has tonight is so special. And last week, she got up in front of a crowd, maybe three or four times this size, pitched her idea, and she walked away with her, a third place prize and $2,000 in scholarship and funding, which is fantastic, but not surprising. So Emma is a wonderful student, and I think you'll see that come through in the venture she's about to show you. Without any further ado, our last presenter of the evening, ninth grader Emma Stern. All 
All right, just want to make sure this works. Okay, we are good. All right, hi everyone. My name is Emma Stern. I am in ninth grade, and oh, sorry, wrong slide. Technical difficulties, okay. There we go. My name is Emma Stern, I am in ninth grade, and I am the founder of Neuron5. So, investors, judges, any other adult in the room, I am gonna take you a step back in time. You are now in high school, and tomorrow, you have a physics quiz on mechanical energy, a history quiz on the Roman Empire, and an English test on a book that you just finished. Think about how you're feeling time-wise, how you're gonna study for all these things, and how much sleep you'll be getting tonight. Sounds stressful, right? Well, this is my reality, and the reality of all the high schoolers I know every day. Without enough time, energy, or assistance to efficiently and successfully study for a test, students just usually opt, opt to just memorizing material to do quickly well on assessments, yet this sets them up to forget this material later on. Experiencing this every day and being constantly frustrated, I decided to do some research. Here's what I found. When memorization gets in the way of learning, do your students understand the material or just memorize and forget? And my personal favorite, cram, memorize, regurgitate, and forget. These article headlines, all written by teachers and professionals in the education industry, don't only testify to the fact that there is an issue on our education system, but also to the fact that there is a very clear and active target market, which are teachers who are looking to beneficially impact the way their students study by eliminating memorization as a whole. I knew that there needed to be a very clear, simple, and efficient solution to this problem. The first time this really resonated with me, I was in my English class this year with Miss O, and she was having us prepare for a test on some vocab words and a book that we had just finished. However, none of the students really felt prepared because the content was so heavy and excruciating to study for. She decided to give us a brief neurology lesson. <laughs> The parts of your um, brain that are responsible for memory are called neurons. And the way to move something from your short-term to your long-term memory is to create strong neuron connections between two things. Thus, she told us to fire the fifth neuron or to create at least five strong neuron connections to move something from our short-term to long-term memory and fully understand it. Thus, Neuron 5 was born. I wanted to name my business after the teacher, Miss O, that taught me to really conceptualize rather than just memorize information. Neuron 5 is a smart way to study in which students enter, oh, sorry, um, teachers enter terms, students enter their definitions, and greater learning is achieved through the creation of visuals and the conceptualization of material. Neuron 5 targets teachers who are frustrated with just simple rote memorization and want to simply and officially affect that the way that their students study by having them actually understand what is going on. So I decided to test Smitho's theory and you know personally I am a high honor student on high honor roll and I've been taking all honor classes but the one thing I was really having trouble with this year was history. Right now I'm taking ancient oral history and it tends to be a very conceptual class with a lot of material to study and very little time to actually prepare for a test. I decided to take her advice and see if conceptualization rather than memorization would help me. Right now, right at the bottom, I have an 100 in the class for this quarter, which is very rare, so I would say that her theory worked well. <laughs> I would hope. So yeah, that testifies to the fact that this actually works. So how did I do this? I decided to focus on three main things relating with the terms. Causes and effects, similarities and differences, and timelines. Three, these three features, which will now be you know, three f main features on my web website, allowed me to actually conceptualize what was going on in a unit and realize any patterns, big ideas, or overall themes that I would need to apply on a test. Additionally, the one thing I did visually was concept mapping. If anyone's unfamiliar, a concept map is basically a graphic organizer in which students or anyone else trying to learn something inputs all the information they know and need to understand on a map so that they're able to visually implement what is going on. As you can see, they can be as simple or as complex as needed to fully convey what you're trying to learn. So to fully um, help you understand what my product actually is, I decided to create a demo wireframe of the concept map tool. So to make this as efficient for students as possible, I decided to create a um, terms to include panel on the left hand side. And these terms would be inputted directly from the teachers to their students so that the students know exactly what they need to study and you know how important everything is. 
And um, for a better time efficiency and organization, I created a simple um, click and drag interface on the right for the tools, such as shapes, brackets, numbers, arrows, sticky notes for comments, and tools to allow for drawings, their own little graphs, and um, pictures. This way, students can fully understand and conceptualize what they're trying to learn and display it in a very visual manner. Throughout my research, I have found, and my own personal experience, I have found a few certain concept map features that people normally use, such as cycles where like, things repeat in a circular form, um, a tree type thing where they start with a big category, they branch out to small categories, and then even more smaller categories. Additionally, this one, although it does not have a very clear pattern, it's also very organized, pretty grid-like, and it's also a way for students to completely convey what they're trying to learn. So, um, you might be thinking, what makes Neuron 5 different? Because obviously there are already concept map tools online, you know, how would I have found these things? How would I have created them? I believe that the one way that Neuron 5 is completely different is the student-teacher interaction on the interface. So. This is the main teacher dashboard, and through this, the teachers can do basically three main things that they need to help their students study. First, they will be able to um, control the amount of students and the different students that are able to access their study guides. Secondly, they will be able to input the terms that the students need to study, and then lastly, track their student progress to make sure they're on the right path which includes um, checking the definitions that the students have inputted for the terms and also checking the completed maps that the students have created. And the completed maps will later be transformed by the teacher into an entire class collaborative map to enable connective, collective learning. On the main student dashboard, I decided it would be best to very clearly lay out what the students had to do. Thus, um, I created three main, main steps. Number one, have you submitted your definitions? So they would look over the terms that they needed to define, which again came directly from the teachers. They would define them and then um, submit them to their teachers so that their teachers know if they're studying the right material or not. Next, have these things been approved? Once they're approved, the edit your map feature right there will be unlocked, so they'll be able to actually create their concept map with the tools that I mentioned earlier. Um, once they submitted their map, they will be able to create the entire class map that the teachers will create after everything is submitted so that they're able to, again, collective learning, class collaboration, make sure and like gain ideas from the other students. So what makes Neuron 5 different from the other things that are available? Currently, my main competitor is Quizlet, yet I like to think of Quizlet as a very one-dimensional way of learning. Quizlet is a student-oriented platform in which students enter their terms and definitions and there are no teachers involved. Students simply just cycle through a list of flashcards as many times as possible to absorb the information as quickly as possible and then spit it back out. This means that they never actually have to think. All they have to do is memorize and then spit something back out to be considered doing well. Neuron 5 is different because all of these tools for actual conceptualization and understanding are very clearly laid out for students and they're easy for teachers to administrate. Additionally, um, there are tools for class collaboration such as the collective learning concept maps and direct help from teachers to students so that students can have assistance whenever needed. In terms of product distribution, the um, subscriptions will be purchased through the schools, administered throughout the teachers, and then the teachers will send all of the information to the students so that they're able to track student progress, make sure the students are studying the right material, and yeah. So for my financial model, I decided to include a one-month subscription and a 10-month subscription, which you know is a little bit over the length of a school year, based on the research I've done, based on you know how schools usually buy Edutech subscriptions. I decided you know it would be best to have a variety of amount of classes, so that you know a school only having five classes wanting to use Neuron Five wouldn't be limited to a large price. Um, because I've been only, on wor only working on my venture for two months, I have so much progress to make and I have so much time to do so. The one thing I'm really excited about doing is creating a school-wide focus group to you know, really think about how students learn and what they need. So through this focus group, I will be most likely starting with my history class. As I mentioned before, very difficult for students to study and it's a very highly conceptual class focusing on main big ideas, topics, and themes. 
So um, in my history class, or any other class, um, I will be asking all students to create a concept map on paper under 15 minutes. That way, I will be able to analyze the maps and see the common features and tools that students commonly use. That will enable me to create a more developed and more accurate wireframe. For those who are unfamiliar, a wireframe is basically a visualization of how a website works, how users will interact with it, and how it functions. With this you know, further develop wireframe, I will be able to go directly to a web developer to make this happen. Um, as Ms. Stokes mentioned before, I have recently competed in the World Series of Entrepreneurship where I was able to walk away with a third place award consisting of $2,000 of funding and scholarship. So this doesn't only testify to the fact that I was able to get my foot in the door and you know, start making this happen, but also to the fact that many other people are interested in what I'm creating and they are looking for a solution that I'm offering. So um, to actually make my website happen, I need a bare minimum of $12,000. This consists of $7,400 of startup, including website development, graphic design, and other web maintenance fees for the first year. Secondly, I need my first year of advertising for $4,600, which includes subscriptions to Content Contact, Google AdSense, and actually uh, attending education conferences to find people that are looking for the solution that I'm offering. Um, just as a thank you, I would love to thank Ms. Stokes and Mr. Glassman. I am constantly astonished with the amazing opportunities that they present for the students in the CL program. And also, I'd like to thank my mentor, Mr. Shantz, for being my rock. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have an amazing day. <laughs> Wow, that's all I have to say. No, but um, congratulations on your grades. Thank it's you. obviously paying off whatever you're doing. Thank you so much. I just had one quick question, and that is about the teacher participation. It seems as though um, there may be some additional time these teachers need to put into interacting with your website. That I don't know. Um, I think okay. How that? How that? Um, how you're going to get the teachers to put that additional time in over and above? their class time. Gotcha, okay. So I've actually been interviewing a few of my teachers in my school, asking them, you know, what ideally would you have in a program like this and would you actually be willing to administer it? And what I found is that, you know, teachers really do care that their students are not just memorizing material, but also understanding it. And also, I, you know, I mentioned Quizlet is one of my top competitors. A lot of the time, I, ha I hear teachers tell students, you know, Quizlet is not an effective way to study, showing one, they really do care, two, they are looking for a better solution. Thank you. Um, so I think it's a great idea and um, very well done in the presentation. Uh, in terms of the concept maps, are you using any techniques from natural language processing and concept modeling to act? Un, you know, sir, uh, so this is sort of an under the hood question. Um, the, the alg are you kind of using some of the algorithms that are out there All right. to form the topics and gotcha. the concepts? Well, I don't know anything about coding or pro processing, uh -huh. but I do intend to go to a web developer once my final wireframe is made. So. I'll hopefully be letting them handle all that. But. And I can kind of talk with you more about that offline, because I actually think some of the um, bigger potential for this is actually, you know, sort of in a nutshell, the idea is that there's a lot of um, machine learning and artificial intelligence tools that are, you, you could actually take what people are inputting and draw out the co topics that aren't mm -hmm. as obvious. And then that starts opening it up to a whole bunch of, um, you know, you could sort of leverage that in a much bigger way. Thank but you. I think it's really cool, and I'm happy to talk to you more. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, g great job. You're obviously like very engaging. I thought that um, you rolled really well with tech problems in the beginning, and like I think you like started a couple of times and made fun of yourself, right? Like that's really a good thing. Like it's a good skill to have that not Thank a lot you. of people do. You know, okay. um, from a like idea standpoint. Um, I think it's really important. I mean, like I said, I'm a teacher. My question for you is, you mentioned Quizlet. Um, is this similar? Do you guys use like Canvas here or anything like other, you know, platform? Oh, Part? yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so gotcha. something like that. So I was wondering, um, could it work with that? Because like I know as a teacher, we use Canvas. I put a lot, like, like we said, a lot of time into Canvas. Would mm -hmm. I then have to then put 
more time into this. I know you mentioned that. So something to consider. And then the other thing is, since teachers are involved with this, will this be cool for students to use? I would you know, hope so. So because, like, cause <laughs> here's the thing. If I'm a teacher and I tell my students this is this great tool, I feel like it's something that they don't want them to use. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, um, but, it, but, like, they love Quizlet because I'm not, like, anti-Quizlet, but, like you said, like, teachers don't want mm -hmm. to, you know. Gotcha. Um, so... Yeah, go for it. Okay, so just to answer your question, the whole thing is that students won't be going about this themselves. They need the teacher collaboration. Right. So just business model again, mm -hmm. the school account will be created, and then um, there will be a teacher directly associated with every student. So um, hopefully they would think it was cool, but the whole thing is that, you know, the teachers are having the students this in hopes that it will achieve better learning. So they would have, like, almost like part of the class. Would be like, right, Correct. Make sure you're doing Yes, correctly. Thank you. I love the idea. I want to be able to use it. Um, <laughs> flashcards and quizlet really are just memorization. Mm -hmm. So having something like this would make my experience so much better. Thank you. Do you know if it's just going to stop at concept maps, or are there more study methods you would be looking into in the future? I believe I have a slide on that. Which oh, okay, this isn't working. Okay. Well, um, basically, I mentioned before a bunch of key tools that I was using, using besides concept maps were timelines, causes and effects, and um, similarities and differences, which, again, would help someone actually conceptualize the material and have a greater understanding of all the big ideas, themes, and um, recurring ideas. So I um, am going to be including separate tools for those, yet those could also be implemented into the concept map tool themselves. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that concludes our demo day. Thank you, entrepreneurs. And thank you, audience, for sticking with us. Um, this is not my business. This is one of 40 ventures that are going to be shared in about an hour from our CEL10 Capstone Showcase. This happens to be a Mexican flair food truck, which will be set up right out there by one of our exchange students. Um, so if you want to come back in an hour and see a whole mess more ventures, please come back. If not, thank you for your time. Thank you for the support and the feedback. And most importantly, thank you for all of your hard work entrepreneurs. Have a great night. Yeah.
Like, Hold on one second. They're all doing the line. Your great, your questions are awesome, by the way. You got to get, you got to get it back to it. Great job. Great. For a lion guy? Um, no, the lion guy. Um, so one of my new things is I am uh, a junior board member of Philly Zoo. Oh, great. So if you wanted to, yeah, it's like they're all about conservation right now. So if you wanted He's to having like, a lot of trouble connecting to the Philly Zoo, so I think that would Yeah, tell, awesome. tell them to, I don't know, email me or email me. And all right, I'm going to make a note. Uh, I'll get them to uh, take it. Like, I, I was able to do a couple weeks ago, get like a tour behind the scenes. Cool. Like, it was just like I'm all just about the things. I'm going to email myself did. right now so I don't forget yeah. to you to Michael. Michael. And I'm going to take a shower. You got it. I really appreciate you taking the time. I, I'm actually off now. Oh, you are? Well, yeah, we had a, a holy day of opportunities. Yeah, so cool. Got a long world of weekends. Anyway, uh, good luck. Thanks, man. We'll see you. How's marriage? It's awesome. Good. Good. Yeah. You guys still doing fun stuff, going on gigs? Uh, yeah, we're going to Italy in uh, a couple weeks. Um, that's great. That's, that's a shame you don't dance with me. I don't think I was anyway. I'm so busy. Thank you. Just like, I just feel yeah. nice to see you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Oh, she is? Yeah. So she is? Yeah. Oh, yeah, new role. Yeah. yeah. Once I saw the thing, I was like, cool. Cool. Yeah. Cool. 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 I was a student uh, leader of that organization. So it was just like the admissions officer for me, my job is to do all the And it's like, so I think there's like real value in which you were to with the impact center. Let me exactly. Like you think that the whole point of the map, right? You just take it away and like, yeah. And especially if you think about it, like you're going you're going to school and you're like, well, I don't like that school, it's bad for them, right? If you take that almost as that possibility away from them, then all of a sudden it's like, that's not even an excuse, yeah. I don't know that they're exactly. like, like my, my thought, it is to me, you gotta, the second thing is like, 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 I especially like your last but, picture because uh, I kept saying, the measurable, like right? how are you gonna measure that? Right, because like, I always thought, I skip three, it's kind of like, how do you get to a second? Because, even if I have held around 15 kids, if I get like 10 of them, five of them, to apply, that's a ton of them. If I get two of them who actually go there, I just mean, like by the time I graduate, I four years of course, the time I'm doing it, I'm trying to make a million dollars. I didn't get anything back for it, you know? I think if you somehow, exactly, like you somehow, you know, modify that, or modify that. Yeah. Thank you for like for the audience? Right. Uh, yeah. Now, the 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 there was a article that just came out. I think one of the big ones that Forbes came out how like overnight like, school visits are even more important now than they were then because you're able to look at so many schools now. But I got to find that article. I was reading. I was like, yeah, I never thought about that way. It's really a big deal. Go do something. Yeah. Especially doing it like you're offering awesome. Awesome. Awesome.
liability on my two cats, it wouldn't be related to me at all because I'm only selling the school. Right, yeah. They'd have to, they have to check that out. I think from the school perspective, that would be kind of one of those things that they would worry about. Oh, yeah, of course. They'd just say, you know, they'd buy a bill or something. Yeah, so that's that's where they'd have to they had to control that with who they admit to be a host. And, um, but and also in the future, like I guess my five year plan, there will be this kind of difficult to uh, monitor stuff like that. The web platform that shows that they can monitor um, participant information, the reports, and hopefully in the future there'd actually be an app that once the students get the campus and everybody visits, they'd be able to check in, they'd be able to almost like Uber, the school would almost track them while they're on campus, geofence, filters, so they leave. Thank you. 